joining me to discuss uh, this uh, is an economist, Professor Ken Ife. He joins me live from our Buja studios and also joining me via Skype is the director and founder of Budget, Olusio Onigmide. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining me on the show this afternoon. Thank you. Prof, let me start from Abuja. Prof, technically, South Africa is in recession. And at the same time, Nigeria has overtaken them as the largest economy in Africa. How does that come to you? Well, the, the, it's, it's a bit academic because it depends on which side you are. If you are government, the government reckons that our rate is 305 Naira to $1. So that means that our GDP is $476 billion. But the investors will reckon that the, the effective rate is the parallel market rate, which is 360 Naira to a dollar. In that respect, we have a lower GDP of $405 billion. So it, is, it depends on which camp you are. But in, in both respects, we are above South Africa, which is $352 billion. Uh, look, since 2012, when we did our rebasing, Nigeria established itself as the biggest economy in Africa, however you look at it. Although in 2016, when we had our devaluation, it did come down to a point where uh, South Africa became uh, a larger economy than ourselves. But again, it's, it's spelled very academic. Okay, let me ask Sheung. Uh, Sheung, South Africa's economy contracted 1.4% the fourth quarter, following 0.8% contraction in the third quarter. Before we look at sectors affected by this, how does this figure come to you compared to what we have here? We had 2.55% in Nigeria. Um, one thing you should, you should understand is that no two economies are the same, so it's a bit difficult to compare Nigeria with South Africa. They have like a third of our population. And they have having much uh, sophistication in terms of their private sector. But well, uh, everyone is aware of the challenges that South Africa has been going through in recent times. Um, it looks like it is uh, sectors, for example, in agriculture, where it's mainly dominated by the wine uh, making and also, also does uh, export of exports to China. Um, so it's, uh, technically, it's been difficult for them to be able to attract new capital into these critical sectors. Um, and also, South Africa also still suffers for a high rate of unemployment. So, most of these industries are dominated by a few organizations or few agencies, um, and the, uh, the ones who are able to have this external engagement. So, I think that what the South African economy needs, uh, it needs to harness the power of its, of its non consumption element. So, too many people without jobs, too many people without consumption power, too many people without disposable income in an economy like that. At the point in time, it begins to fit you. You cannot be able to accelerate forward. So the problem of South Africa is fundamentally put out of inequality. But too many people are of, uh, not contributing anything, either to the domestic or to the global economy. So as long as those things continue to exist within their environment and without disposable income to also uh, make up demands in terms of retail, there will still be challenges with that economy. No, indeed. Prof, uh, out of 10, industries uh, in South Africa, seven out of 10 contracted, leaving just finance, mining, and personnel services. And this was not able to hold the country away from recession. What do you think is responsible for this trend? I was reading through, and uh, the report is coming that the next budget of South Africa will either make or mar the economy. Well, mining has always been their strongest uh, component of the economy. And so I'm not surprised that it's holding up. But you know that there are so many headwinds right now um, caused by the, the instability, the global instability. And a lot of it are coming from China now, as you see. Um, but America, so not America, sorry, but South Africa, I'm surprised that the agriculture has gone down the most because they do have a very strong agricultural production system, although they are very vulnerable to drought. Uh, very, very vulnerable. Nigeria has four times more surface water than South Africa. So water can be a severe challenge, water management. Uh, and I can see that that could be part of it. And also know that the, the, the weather, they are exposed to more hazard. Uh, we are so lucky in Nigeria, to be honest, when you compare us to South Africa in many, in many respects. But I was, uh, I was surprised that more of these industries 
actually caved in. Uh, you know. Okay, Shale, Shale, let's now look at this. You've, you've identified some issues now. So what, what is the next step to be taken? Considering the fact that, yes, a budget is expected, a lot is expected from South Africa to re-energize that economy. What, what's the way to go? Before we even start looking at the effects of even coronavirus, though there's no confirmed case in South Africa, according to the last check. Um, so um, recently, I think last week, uh, when the uh, Prime Minister for South Africa presented, I mean, the Finance Minister for South Africa presented the budget to the South African Parliament, so it's under consideration. The budget of around 90 billion um, dollars, um, it was like 14 trillion um, um, rand. Um, so uh, that's under that consideration right now uh, by the South African um, the Parliament. And, and there are analysts um, in South Africa we have held the budget that there is no um, increase in taxes. So the understanding that this is a period to be more conservative about taking more revenue from the government in itself. So they'll be more careful. But at this point, South Africa needs to expand, we need to seek new markets. There's no other thing that it needs to do. There's a lot of dependence on China, on its agriculture, on its mining. Um, also need to find new markets in use exciting places. Maybe it could be in Latin America, it could be in the northern part of America. Those are the places that need to be. And also trading within Africa. So that's great exports, for example, like the MTN and the other, um, um, like the, the COVID ICT sector. So it's also maybe be an opportunity to look within the African space, how much opportunity you can find to be able to grow its economy and also to plug people back there in. So the challenge Alert from now, system UI server. The, the challenge I see mainly is that the South African economy is between um, and they are already also feeling the shocks of the global system. Okay, uh, okay, Prof, let's come back home now, back to Nigeria. Uh, Prof, my question goes to you now. We posted a uh, beautiful one, uh, I said earlier, 2.55% for the fourth quarter of 2019, uh, you know, following the highest, that's the highest growth since recession in 2016. Now, what do you think is responsible for this positive at this time, despite all of the challenges, even globally? Well, Nigeria is, is getting stronger, actually. And, um, and I know that the agriculture has played a very good part. Manufacturing sector is recovering uh, very st strongly. And, um, and we are going to have very early rain. So that even means that we might do a bit better this year than, than last year in, in, in agriculture. But of course, even though we are, we are doing fairly OK in agriculture, we are still hostage to so many ex exports of our produce to the neighboring countries who are exploiting the differential in, in foreign exchange uh, between Naira and, uh, and, and Sefa, which has dropped by 50%. You know, we used to buy three Sefa with one Naira, now it's 1.5. So that differential encourages them to rapidly import our goods. But don't forget again that we had this um, incident of border closure that has limited uh, movement. Because what normally happens is that our food moves away to, to the outside the neighboring countries in during harvest. For example, uh, 50,000 naira per ton for things like uh, soya beans. Then four months later, they come back and we are buying them $150,000. So, sorry, 150,000 naira, three, almost three times the price, simply because we are not investing as much in value addition. And, and, um, and processing and storage. And I can't understand why a country like Nigeria will continue to experience 30 to 70% post-harvest losses, even though we are the biggest producer of food in Africa and, and one of the five countries in the world that is sufficient, uh, so to say, in terms of its production on food. But to have such a high level of post-harvest losses, plus what goes on in our border with our food, creates that, that uh, uh, impression of, of, of food security uh, challenges when, when it shouldn't be the case. Although, having said that, we are hostage to so many different conflicts in different zones. Uh, Boko Haram in the northeast and banditry in the northwest and even in the north central, where much of the food is grown, we have uh, clashes of our production systems, you know, the heather and, the, and, the, and crop production. So those notwithstanding, we're still, still suffering huge post harvest losses. And in fact, if we invest in productive capacity and cottage processing, then we should stop much of the export of our raw grains and raw, raw food. 
you know, which is, uh, which is an embarrassment, to be honest. Mm. Mm. Prof, let me follow up with that before I go to, uh, back, come back to Lagos for Sheung. Uh, let's look at population and quality of life between these two countries. The biggest, uh, talking about the African continent, South Africa and Nigeria. What do you make of quality of life and population? Uh, well, first of all, you know, the, I was surprised that the power, well, there was a loss in their power sector because they have 40 times more power than Nigeria. We have four times their population, and they have 40 megawatts of power, while we have four and a half thousand megawatts of power. So they are effectively 40 times more uh, power uh, per, per GDP, uh, per, per capita, than Nigeria. So if they're beginning to have such problem in power, then you must, you must wonder what, what will happen to Nigeria in, in terms of power. But you come into in terms of uh, quality of life, I mean, I've been to South Africa, many parts of South Africa. They have infrastructure. And the infrastructure is so fundamental in, 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 in attracting investment and in improving quality of life. They have good roads. They have the, the whole networks, different types of transportation networks. The rail is working. The aviation is, of course, as you know, that's working. But we don't have as, as, as good quality uh, road network compared to South Africa. And then not to talk about power. Water, we have far more water than South Africa, uh, enough to irrigate literally a huge percentage of our arable land. But that is not the same with South Africa. They have short shortage, absolute shortage of, uh, of water. And it does affect them and their neighboring countries as well. So in, to sum it up, they do enjoy a, a better quality of life than Nigeria. There's no doubt about that. And it's principally due to infrastructure, the state of infrastructure that they, they enjoy more than us. Mm -hmm. but, but the young shall grow, and I know that we, we, will, we, will, uh, we will get there one, one day. Prof is being very Sooner optimistic later, there. Anyway. Sheo, I'm going to ask you the same question. You deal more with figures. Uh, 50 million people in South Africa, almost 200 million in Nigeria, 40,000 megawatts in South Africa, 4,500 megawatts in Nigeria, quality of life and... What do you make of that with regards to all of these figures we are talking about? I mean, we can't, we can't compare South Africa with Nigeria. We cannot compare South Africa in terms of quality of life with uh, Nigeria. The challenge is always remain about how, and let's, let's bring it down here. Let's look at revenue, for example. South Africa central government presented a budget of $90 billion. The entire government budget of the federal government, state and local governments in Nigeria is around for $50 billion. So we are like even halfway. The you know, GDP per capita for South Africa is three times. You know, it's three times what you have in Nigeria. Where we are doing 2,200 in terms of GDP per capita, South Africa is close to around 6,000. And all of this is just because um, it shows that the size of GDP, you have 200 million people doing the, the almost the same size of GDP with what 60 million, 50 million people are doing. So we cannot just look at GDP as in isolation. We have to look at GDP per capita. We have to also look at revenue per capita. We also have to look at revenue as a measure of GDP. When you see South Africa talking about revenue to GDP of close to 25, 28%, you have Nigeria talking about revenue to GDP of around 8 to 9%. So all of this shows that Nigeria's GDP is even too small for the size of its, for the size of the economy of the, of the population we have. And if you look at us, we might be growing at 2.55%, but our population is also growing at a faster, at a higher rate. You know, we are one of the countries the highest level of population growth. So if your population is growing faster than your, than your revenue, than your GDP growth, that means your GDP per capita is collapsing. That's on the average. You have more poor people in your country. So it's very important that Nigeria needs to wake up. Our GDP, in terms of the size of population that we have, should be around a trillion dollars, not around 400 billion dollars. And that means we need to sweat productivity in this country. We need to sweat non-oil economy in this country. And that's why when at 2.55% does not look like us, post, I um, mean, at the advent of this, um, of the First Republic, up to 2008, we were going at 4, 5, 6%. You know, until the recent recession, we, that went to the having some 2%, and we had for some 3% growth. We need to accelerate much more. And this is about looking for what are the environments, what are the spaces that are getting depressed in the Nigerian economy. For example, trade. The trade has technically been in recession. Just because somehow we, make, we think our border closure um, approaches will not have the implication. It does have that implication in our trade, especially the retail and the wholesale market. If you look at real estate in Nigeria, it's also 
growing. It is also technically in recession. That sector, just because we have not found the mortgage element to liberalize capital formation in that space, we have not been able to grow the real estate sector. Same thing also, even now with agriculture growing around 2%, most of the growth that has powered at 2.55% has been from ICT, has been from services. And so, in some sort of way, we also have to think clearly how do we grow the critical sectors that have got the largest chunk of Nigerians? This is the only way we can move forward as a country. I believe, I don't, I, I, we don't have the level of infrastructure that's out yeah. We just don't have it. Yeah. Now, like Prop said, we have, we are struggling to even get 5,000 in our South Africa's economy is even facing the blackout, despite having almost 40,000. That's in true. We are market capitalization on JNB is almost a trillion dollars. We are already doing around 100 billion dollars. So, you know, look at the gap is just too much. I mean, we have to step forward. And do what exactly is right. All right, there, founder and director of Budget uh, Shell Onigmi Day, and also from Abuja, Prof Ken Ife. Thank you very much uh, for joining us on Business Nigeria this afternoon to break it down, talking about Nigeria overtaking South Africa, breaking down the figures.